Hey everybody, this is Mike. Welcome back to the shop and welcome to the Z Motorsports channel. Um, I apologize, this is going to be just as kind of a quick video. Um, I apologize I'm not doing any machining, welding, um, repairing or, or anything. This video is going to be a little out of the norm. Um, this is just going to be me rambling for a few minutes, so I apologize. Uh, just fair warning. Um, anyway, uh, this subject seems to come up about this time of year every year um, when we start talking about cooling systems we're in the middle of summer um, even here in northern utah where our temperatures are in the 95 to 100 degree range some days 105 um, it's 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 hard to keep these jeeps cool um, and, I'll, and i'll i'll cover a few of the inherent problems or reasonings behind that and then let me go into kind of a little explanation on why we compound those problems when we make modifications to our Jeeps, which is what we all do. Um, so, first of all, if you have a seven, uh, let, me, let me back up. So, the, the modern Jeep, 07 to current, uses a different cooling system and fan system than the predecessors. All the predecessors use mechanical fans, um, viscous coupling uh, fan clutches. The 07 was unique in that fashion when it came out. Uh, it wasn't unique to have an electric fan, it was unique to a Jeep Wrangler. So they put electric fans on it. Now the 7 through 11 with a 3.8 liter engine, among many of its other um, downsides, it only had a two speed fan. It was a smaller fan, it was a 17 inch blade, um, so it was, it was small and it only had two speeds and the way they controlled it was pretty basic. Um, basically they had a resistor in there so at low speed when it come on it would go through a resistor drop the voltage down to around eight eight and a half volts and that would be low speed. When it called for high speed it would send it through another set of contacts in the relay and it would bump it to full battery voltage which would be your high speed. Even at high speed it didn't move a lot of air. Um, so you, you gotta, you've got to think of these Jeeps in the, in the sense that you're trying to get airflow through that radiator. The fan is there to assist but when you start doing certain things to it then you're relying on the fan more and more. Now, when they went to the Pentastar in, 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 excuse me, in 12, um, they used a PMW, a Pulse Modulated Width Fan Control System, and they went to a 19-inch fan, which I think it has the capabilities of around 37, 3,800 um, cubic feet per minute of airflow at high speed. The problem Chrysler designed into that system was it's reverse biased. So every other manufacturer out there on, I say, 100 hertz, um, frequency, the higher the hertz, the faster the fan speed runs. Well Chrysler in their infinite wisdom, I don't know why, inverted that. So the higher the frequency, the slower the fan runs. Um, and, it, and the computer had a hard time um, measuring that, or not measuring, but controlling that. So it's a very bespoke system in the fact that no other manufacturer was doing it that way. So Chrysler decided to try it out on a vehicle that they know is a brick and we're going to make it a bigger brick going down the road. I, I can hear, I mean, even over my V8, I can hear Pentastar Jeeps coming up 100, 200 yards behind me with that fan screaming. I can hear them over my engine that's right in front of me. And because that can fan, it, 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 it's just the, the computer, the Chrysler computer has a hard time controlling that even right from the factory with the OEM programming, operating system, everything. It just struggles. But it does move more, more airflow than the earlier predecessor. So um, the problem we have with these radiators is you've got the standard Jeep grill. Um, let me take you over here to a, I've got a radiator here that's, um, out, out of the vehicle, it's a Jeep radiator. Um, let me bring you over to show you it and I'll show you the size of the radiator. Then we'll come back and show you the natural obstructions and then show you what we go ahead and throw okay, in front Okay, so of this it. is an aluminum radiator but it's basically, it's, it's the same physical um, height and width as an OEM um, radiator with the plastic, uh, Jeep uh, radiator with the plastic tanks. This one's a little thicker um, for a little more capacity because of my uh, 
uh, 6.2 liter LS that I'm running, but you still have 22 inches by 21 inches to the tune of about 462 um, square inches of surface area of the radiator. Now, um, well, in a second here, we'll go back over, we'll measure the grill, the grill opening, and I'll show you right off the bat the inherent, inherent discrepancies. While I'm here at the radiator, I want to show you another thing. You also have core thicknesses. Now this one's about, a, I believe this is a 42 millimeter. I've run a 52 millimeter before and, and didn't have any problems. It's a, it, it, it's, it had a little more, it had a little more capacity for coolant, but it, um, and it, it, it cooled about the same as this one. Um, I've seen people running thicker and thicker and thicker. The problem, th the problem there becomes, yes, you do have more, cooling, more coolant capacity, but you've got, such a, you've got so much resistance going through the transmission cooler, the AC condenser, then the radiator before you even get to the engine and, and the fan side of the, of, the, uh, of the radiator, the cooling stack, if you will. So the thicker you go, you would think that, okay, I'm getting more capacity. Yes, you do have more capacity, but you're not expelling the whole, the whole point. Remember, the whole point of a cooling system is to expel heat. You, it's to transfer that heat away from the engine and the radiator is, the, is one of the ways they do that. They also do it around the block and everything, but I'll get to that in a minute. But the radiator is the number one reason, place it expels that heat. So if you're backing air up, because it can't go through, you're not pulling that heat away from the radiator itself. So you want to be careful. There's a, there's a fine line there between thickness and efficiency. Um, so you, you, you want to be careful of that. Um, let's go over to the Jeep now and I'll show you the grill and I'll show you right off the bat as these things roll off the assembly line right where the discrepancy is. Remember, 462 square inches of surface area of this radiator. Okay, remember so that now number. we're back at the front of the Jeep. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have our grill opening. This is where it gets tricky. So we actually have about 24... 24 inches, maybe a little better than 24 inches, but 24 inches to your, to your inside of your core support here by 11 inches. That, I gotta get my cheat sheet for this, sorry. That is only 264 square inches of area. So you can see we already have a deficit of 200 square inches of the opening versus the actual radiator square inches. Now, if you take one and a half wide by 11 tall, and that's uh, 16 and a half Q, uh, square inches, and there's six of these bars, that's another 100, that's another 100 square inches of surface area that is in, being interrupted by, or that is interrupting the airflow. So you can see we have an uphill battle just getting air through that radiator, that, that cooling stack, by design, right off the, right off the, the assembly line. So, a couple things you want to keep in mind. Um, as we lift our vehicles, it may, it may sound counterintuitive, but as we lift them, yes, there's more airflow underneath them, but the drag, because you're going up, the coefficient of drag increases tremendously. And then for every mile per hour over 55 miles per hour, the coefficient of drag multiplies exponentially. So if you're trying to go down the road at 65, 75, 80 miles an hour, you're having to push that throttle down, you burn more fuel, which fuel is what? Energy. Energy is what? Heat. So all that heat is being burned up, or that fuel is being burned up and turned into heat. Remember, you don't create energy, you just transfer the form of energy. So we're fuel is being transferred to heat, heat is being transferred to the energy through the combu internal combustion engine to rotational through the crankshaft. So as that heat is being put off of that engine, it's got to come out through the cooling system. And the more you're having to push that vehicle to punch through that air, um, the more drag, the, the, the more energy it cons it's consuming and which therefore heat goes up and it becomes harder and harder to get all that heat out of the way from the vehicle. Now, um, gearing helps. I know a lot of people say, well, I, I, I put 35s, 37s on mine and I'm still running my 410 gears. 
yeah, you can do it, but you're having to push that throttle down a little bit more to do it, and you're not taking advantage of the efficiency of that engine, and you're not, um, you're not letting that engine work in, 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 at, a, at, a, at a lighter duty cycle, if you will. It's being asked to be performing at you know, 70, 75% rather than 35, 40% just going down the highway. So all that heat is just trying to come out of that system, or out of that engine. Now, re-gearing helps because yeah, you get your RPM up. People think, well, my RPM's higher, I'm gonna burn more fuel. Not necessarily. At lower RPM, if you're pushing it, you're gonna be running into power enrichment mode where instead of 14.7 to one air fuel ratio, you might be 12 and a half to 13 to one percent fuel ratio. And now all of a sudden you re-gear and you're back to running in closed loop at optimum uh, uh, air fuel ratio, your efficiency is gonna go up. I noticed, that, I noticed that with mine. I had the 3.8 in it with 35s and 538 gears. It went down the road okay. I had, over, I had 95,000 miles on it. It went down the road okay. But on the little rollers on the interstate, the cruise control set, I could have my HP tuners or my snap-on scanner plugged into it, and I could be watching my power enrichment, and I could be watching my fuel trims, and I could be watching my O2 sensors, and I could watch my O2 sensors all of a sudden flatline at 900 millivolts and fa power enrichment mode kick in and drop to 11 and a half, 12 and a half to one uh, fuel enrichment and it's, it maintained cruise control and it, and it did it, but it was just dumping the fuel in because now it's bypassing the O2 sensors and it's saying, it's looking at a lookup map in that ECM and it's going, okay, I can't, none of these configurations are working. I'm dumping fuel into it to protect the motor. It doesn't want to run it lean. So it throws fuel in it. And you could almost watch the freaking fuel gauge drop on it. Now all of a sudden I go to add, I double the, double the cubic inches. So I went from a 3.8 to a 6.2. You'd think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be burning twice as much fuel. Just the opposite. I can be running down the interstate now. It's, I'm running 37s with 456 gears instead of the 538s and 35s at just under 2,000 RPM, whereas before I was about 2,600 RPM, I can be running down the road 2,000 RPM, have my HP uh, tuners scan, looked, hooked up to it, watching all my parameters, and I'm at 14.7 to one. The computer, the ECM, is in full control of my fuel system saying, I, I have 100% control over this. It needs a little more fuel, I can go up a point, half a point, three-tenths of a point. It needs to pull a little pull fuel back, it can do it. It doesn't go into power enrichment. Um, I've got to mash it and basically take it into um, full power, uh, into power mode for it to even go out of outside the operating system and go to a lookup table and go into power enrichment. And I picked up a mile to a mile and a half per gallon going by twice as big an engine. So it's just, it's all about efficiency. Um, now, like I said, we're, we're pushing this big brick down the road. We're asking a lot of it. It's got a lot of energy that it's using. And now if you have the winch sitting right here, you have, uh, let's just say, uh, let's just take measure this. This is a low profile winch, but let's just say power, let's say power plant. Worn power plant's a popular winch. I believe that's just a little bit narrower than this one. This one's 22, let's just say that the uh, power plant's 18 inches wide, but it's nine inches tall. So nine inches tall puts it right there. What does that do? Well, man, I've got five and a half inches. I have five and a half inches of exposed grill area now above that winch. So I have hardly any airflow naturally, I wanna emphasize naturally, going through that radiator or going through that cooling stack. Now granted, the power plant does have some fins and a few things like that cut into it, but still, behind those fins, what do you have? You've got a motor and a compressor, so it's blocking airflow. You really want to sink your winches down properly. Get them down between the frame rails. Um, even my control box here is right at the bottom of my grill openings, so that's not obstructing any airflow there. The stinger bar, it's two inches. Yes, it does take away a little bit, more importantly, as the air is coming in, it's actually creating a little bit of a diversion. So you're gonna have a little bit of a low pressure right here. Ideally, and I've, I keep telling myself when I, when I scratch up my bumper or have to redo it or whatever, I'm more than likely gonna cut the stinger bar off. I put it on for looks. Um, I don't necessarily know that I'd do that again, 
but let's say you've got a power plant right here and then what do you do you've got five inches right above here and you say you put a light bar or two big you know kc gravity six lights on top of there you have hardly any natural path for airflow through that cooling stack so you're relying on that fan to do majority of the work you don't want to rely on that fan to do all the work you want that fan to actually work as little as possible so um let's see again i apologize i'm just kind of um just kind of shooting off the cuff here oh um while we're talking about airflow um when the air is coming in here going down the highway you have a high pressure that's coming in you want to keep a low pressure in the engine bay so um the, the it's basically the air going underneath the vehicle is going to create a low pressure so air is going to want to go from high to low go through the engine bay and out the bottom to expel that heat out there through the radiator and down and out now when you start putting full skids belly skids um all that underneath there you basically are encapsulating the underneath that underneath that vehicle and now you're creating a high pressure in the engine bay and it cannot the high pressure outside cannot overcome the high pressure in the engine bay so you basically have a stalemate of air pressure trying to get into that engine bay it basically turns the underneath of that jeep into an oven um i've worked on these i've worked on these jeeps 12 plus years now i've worked on a lot of them where i've pulled skids down and the wiring harnesses that run along the frame rails even though they're six seven eight inches away from the exhaust the wiring harnesses are just the the, the convoluted casing is just melted because that heat backs up underneath there i can show you underneath mine my 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 wiring harnesses my they just look as good and it's i've got 115,000 miles on this it's 10 years old it looks as good as the day it rolled off the showroom floor as far as wire looms because I'm not backing all that heat up under that engine. So keep, in, keep that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about skids. Um, I'll, I'll, come back to, I'll come back to that right at the end because I don't want to offend too many people too soon. Um, anyway, <clears throat> um, let's see, we talked about, oh, another thing, keep your, your rubber flaps in here. A lot of times people will pull these rubber flaps out when they're running their, their lights, their winches, so forth please keep those rubber flaps inside there that helps to divert that airflow through the radiator and without those the air is going to come in and what's it going to do take the path of least resistance so it's going to go around the outside of the radiator and you're not going to get the airflow across the radiator or across the cooling stack so you want to make sure you keep those 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 rubber flaps intact which divert that air through the cooling stack now i've got a pretty good size um, transmission cooler on mine I want to say it's like 12 by 12 by 11 and a half yeah 12 by 11 and a half and it's it's bolted i've got it bolted to the outside of the core support and then i'm running a manual transmission ac condenser in this because i did not want the transmission cooler down in the bottom half that, that, that's, that was just a waste right from right from chrysler's uh infinite wisdom so um i've got the manual one in mine um just because I don't, I, I, my transmission cooler's out here. Transmission usually runs cool. I don't really have any heating issues. Um, but just, just, just be thinking always about efficiency and how efficiently you can get that airflow through that cooling stack. Um, let's see, what else? What else do I want to talk about real quick? Uh, flat fenders. Guys who have flat fenders on them, they will a lot of times put um, all kinds of funky inner fenders. Those inner fenders, if they're not designed right, they can actually create high pressure inside the engine bay. So there again, it's going to cause kind of the same issue as with, um, as with in, uh, armor underneath because it, it's not going to be able to get that heat, the natural progression through it. Um, you, want, you want that airflow to flow through there. Now, when you turn your air conditioning on, your fan is all automatically going to come on because it's tied into the AC system. It's going to go through the, the P Chrysler has a PCM, uh, powertrain control module. Um, I've got an ECM, which is an engine control module that controls the GM side. And then I've got my Jeep BCM. So my, mine's a little different configuration, but the theory is still the same. When my AC kicks on, it tells the ECM, hey, I'm calling for AC. I need to make sure and start now measuring condenser pressure. 
So there's a it uses your, your air conditioning condenser pressure to regulate your fan. So as your compressor goes up, it's gonna ramp your fan up as, your, as the pressure goes down. So as you're running down the road, that air, natural airflow is gonna be going through that cooling stack. Your fan's gonna be running a lower duty cycle. If you have all this blockage and everything up here and it's hitting this, and then you have skids and everything on it, you're trying to push a high pressure into a higher pressure, that fan is gonna be working, you're gonna be working a snot out of that fan. Perfect example, I uh, worked on one six, no, May-ish I guess, so maybe not four, four months ago, three, four months ago, just as our heat was starting to come up a little bit, I was working on one, and all of a sudden, his fan's just screaming, just running around, just run, running down the road. Well, he had put a power plant on, he had a stinger with um, dimple dyed sheet metal on it, this whole front of this, and, and then he had a light bar, the whole front of this, G and, and he put skids on, and he's like, I've got heating problems. Well, yeah, you do. You got a lot of heating problems. Number one, you've got, you've added weight, and number two, you've eliminated most of the path of airflow through that cooling stack. Um, the fan, his fan was running at over 70% duty cycle, just running down the, just, just running down the road at light throttle, 55, 60 miles an hour. He was at 70% duty cycle. You, if those fans start ramping up much over 80%, they will go into uh, default mode and basically shut down. They're not designed to run at 100%, regardless of what everybody thinks, oh, you know, fans 100%, 100%, it's not, gonna, it's not designed to run at 100%. It's gonna, it's gonna self, it goes into self-preservation. It's gonna try to protect that fan. It's gonna protect the motor, but it's also gonna protect the fan, and it generally will not run above 80% for very long before it shuts down. And at that point, you basically have no airflow going through there if you're solely relying on that fan. One way to tell is if you're running down the, uh, on mine, I, I can, I've got a hundred, I know I've got a hundred, most, most Jeeps have a 195 degree thermostat in them. I can be running down the road at 78 to 80 seems to be about the, about the outside ambient temperature. At 78 to 80, I can be running down the road, no air conditioning on or anything, and I'm sitting right in the thermostat. 195, 197 degrees. It'll sit right there, all the, you know, 16 miles to work or, you know, whatever. Start climbing grades, it might climb a little bit. But for the most part, running up and down the Wasatch front here, 195, 197, it'll sit there up to about 80 degrees. You start getting above 80 degrees and it might start moving up towards closer to 200, 201. My fan doesn't come on until 210. At 210, my fan comes on, it comes on at what they call an idle speed, and it's about 15 to 18% duty cycle. At 210, it'll come on and it'll pull it down to about 203 where it kicks off. So between 195 and 203, if I stay in that range, my fan's not running. That is fully, that, that is complete natural airflow through the cooling stack, through the engine bay. When I turn my AC on, I actually start running cooler because now, even running down the road, I'm pulling, I'm using the fan to maintain, because now it's looking at all, it's looking at all the parameters. It's looking at engine temperature, transmission temperature, and AC condenser pressure. And it's, at that point, it's mostly being controlled by that AC condenser pressure, and the radiator and the, or the cooling, the engine cooling and the transmission cooling are kind of getting a free pass because they're getting lower temperatures because the, the AC system is what's calling for more heat or excuse me, calling for more fan. Now the downside of that is, is you're pulling more heat out of, the, out of the inside of the box. You pull that heat out, where's that heat going? The heat's going right here in the AC condenser where it's expelling that heat right in front of your radiator. So the downside is, is the heat coming out of your passenger cabin area is going right across your radiator now. But still, the fan's running at, you know, mine normally will run under 22, 25%. 15 to 18 is pretty common when I'm on the AC, just cruising lightly down the road. Um, Off-road, if I'm crawling, I'm climbing a long, steep hill or whatever, I might get up in the 30% range. But other than that, it generally does not um, run, ramp up that high. Um, the modern engine is designed to run a little warmer than two, three decades ago. People think 200 degrees is hot. Um, emissions have changed, things have changed now where they try to keep these engines running over 200 degrees. Two, I think GM says theirs mo runs most, most efficiently um, 210 to 220. Uh, I think Chrysler tries to keep theirs between like 200 and 215, right in that range. So pretty, pretty close. 
but if I mean if you're hitting two if you're hitting 210 215 it's not that big of a deal um, you start hitting 225 230 yeah it's I mean especially with you you put a oh like a 13 16 I got a 16 pound cap on there general rule of thumb is you're gonna imp up two degrees for every pound of pressure so um, water boils at 212 um, slightly uh, higher than that with 50-50 uh, ethylene glycol and distilled water mix. Now you put 16 pounds of pressure to it. That's going to bump it up to 30. That's going to bump it up to th or 32 degrees. So you're close to 255, 260 degrees before you're going to boil these things over. I don't recommend running that hot. Um, you get up around 230, 235, no worries, 240, yeah. 245, I'd start backing things off a little bit. You don't want to get crazy. Um, you want to leave yourself a little margin for error in there. But those are under extreme conditions. If you're running at that temperature, running down the road, you need to start looking at some of these other issues. Number, you know, thinking weight, airflow, airflow, airflow being number one. Then start looking at weight, um, gearing blockages all that kind of stuff all all play a factor in your cooling system and 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 and, and it's just it's it's usually not one thing when, when when i've seen these things come in with eating problems it's a it's a multitude of things because we've you know because the owners changed this changed that and a little bit here a little bit there well the fan's been compensating for those obstructions for the extra weight for the the wrong gearing in the axles and I know gears aren't sexy um, people will put lights on and winches and all this other crap before they ever think about doing gears but we really need to change our mindset and we need to think efficiency because we have a big brick we're pushing down the road and it's about it's got the aerodynamics of a phone booth and they're heavy I mean Mine's 6,000 pounds and I don't have rooftop tents, I don't have full armor, I don't have, I'm, mine's just mildly built and I'm 6,000 pounds. So I know guys with one tons and you know, full armor and everything, they're 72, 7,400 pounds. Then you go throw a rooftop tent on it and everything, that's asking a lot of a little V6 engine and the cooling system. Um, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back now and, I'm, and, I'm, and I, I apologize if this offends some people, I'm just going to I'm just going to try to throw this out there and be honest with you. The biggest problem I see with people building their Jeeps over the years, and, it, and I'm not say, I'm going to say Jeeps because this video is more geared towards Jeeps cooling, Jeep, Jeep cooling systems, but it could be race cars, it could be street rods, it could be motorcycles, it could be whatever. I've, I've built all of them. Have a game plan in your head of what you want and be realistic what you want, what you want your Jeep, let's just talk Jeeps. What do you want your Jeep to be when it's done? And then try to stick to that plan because if you don't know what you want, I see more people going different directions and changing directions and throwing things. This part doesn't complement this one and now you're changing out this one. Number one, it's a waste of money, a lot of money. We, you know, we all work hard for our money. You don't want to go throwing it away. And number two, you really don't have a direction on what you want to go with your Jeep. Then you end up one day and you go, I've got a trailer queen and I want to drive it, but I can't drive it on the road. I, I see that, I see that so much. Um, people go, you know, I've got this Jeep, it's bone stock. They put a couple inches of lift under it, run 35s, and it does 85% of the trails they want to do. Perfect, it's great. Well, then they see somebody with 40s and one tons that climbs one obstacle better than they do, and then in their head, I got to have one tons and 40s. And then they don't realize, well, that's my daily driver, and I'm going to drive that thing around with 40s to the tune of $3,000 for tires every other year for two trails a year. So ask yourself, what do you want this vehicle to do when you're done? If you want it to be a buggy, great, build a buggy. If you want it to be a daily driver and you know, commuter and you want to go hit some fire roads, you can do that with a bone stock Wrangler. If you want a weekend wheeler that's, that can do, you know, three plus, three, three plus, maybe an occasional four trail here and there, and daily drive it, then stick to that plan because you're going to be much happier with your Jeep in the end and you're going to waste less money, 
You're going to have less money invested in it. It's going to be more enjoyable to you because it fits what you want it to do. Um, I, I just would like to encourage people to do that. I, I see it all the time. People build their Jeeps up. They run these 40s. Now it's a trailer queen. They drive it two, three times a year. And they have to trailer it when they do. And then they, the fun factor goes away. Um, mine is... I've, I, my, mine's a daily driver. I drive the snot out of it. I'm on 37s. I can do, it'll probably do, well, not probably, it will. It'll do more aggressive trails than I'll probably ever put it on, but I don't want to bang it all up and scratch it up. I'll go do fours. So I've done some four pluses. Um, we wheel in a lot of different areas, but I can drive 70 miles an hour, 70 miles to a trailhead and wheel air down, wheel, come back, air up, and drive 70 miles, an hour, or 70, miles, 70 miles an hour back to camp, no problem. We went to South Dakota last year, well, last two years for Jeep rally or gatherings, and it's not uncommon to see people trailer their Jeeps to lo the longer distance trails. The problem with that is, is not, most of the trails over there aren't out and backs, they're loops. So and then you're trying to have somebody else take you over to drop over to pick up their truck and trailer and it's just a, it's a turns into be a mess. Um, so just ask yourselves and be honest, what do you want it to do? I've driven my Jeep cross country 750 mile days to when we went back east to pick up our, our coach from the paint shop. The wife and I knocked down a couple 750 mile days. We hopped on the Jeep, set the cruise at 72, 73 miles an hour, 750 miles, a couple of stops for fuel and it handled it great. Hooked it up to the motorhome we got over there, drug it back, did some wheeling, and I can put this on the trail. It looks just as good on, you know, Poison Spider. It looks every bit at home as it does on the Las Vegas Strip. So just ask yourself, what do you want your Jeep to do? Ha come up with an idea, come up with a plan, and try to stick to it. You'll, you'll be much happier in the long run um, if, if you do that, rather than just try to throw money at something and then it turns into something that you really didn't want and now you're unhappy with it and you're hardly ever using it. So I apologize if that is not politically correct, but I've um, been doing this a long time and I see a lot of people end up unhappy with their vehicles, selling them because they're just not what they started out wanting to do. So anyway, I, I hope this has been informative. Again, this is pretty off the cuff. Um, I hope it answers some questions. Just, just look at airflow. That's the biggest thing. Airflow, try to, try to make everything work as efficiently as possible. So thanks for watching. Um, again, I hope this was informative.